Hello everyone. Welcome to the virtual panel discussion on exploring peer support in ambulatory care. Lessons from the field. Before, sorry. I'm sorry, um, we have a little technical difficulty at this moment. Um, there you go. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, again, I would like to welcome everyone to the virtual partner discussion on exploring peer support in ambulatory care lessons from the field. Before we start, here are a couple housekeeping items. You can download the slides and resource materials from the handout pane. We encourage everyone to participate in the conversation by typing your questions and comments in the chat box. Please note that you will be mute until the Q&A session, and if you wish to speak, please click, click on the hand button to raise your hand and you will be unmuted when it is time for questions. You can also adjust the size of your slide viewed by clicking and moving the three lines between the panel and the slideshow. After the webinar, we will send you the recording of this webinar and we'll post the slides for download at the PCPCC website. And last but not least, please take the post-webinar survey. Your feedback will be greatly appreciated. About PCPCC, PCPCC, or patient-centered primary care, aimed to advance an effective and efficient healthcare system built on a strong foundation of primary care and the patient-centered medical home. Our mission is to promote collaborative approaches to improve primary care. We also promote the shared principles of primary care, which represent all aspects, all aspects of healthcare. We focus on the concept of patient-centered care through patient-family engagement and patient activation, which will help us reach the goal of improved cost quality and experience outcomes. Through the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, PCPCC <clears throat> SAM or PCPCC Support and Alignment Network strives to improve patient and family, clinician, and community strategy for engagement. We are working with our key partners to provide valuable education programs and technical assistance tools to help practices meet their needs. And to learn more about how we can help your practice, please visit pcpcc.org slash tcpi. And now I would like to turn to my colleague, Manny, Mary Minetti, the moderator of today's discussion. Mary. Great. Thank, thank you, away. Tanya. And thank you all for joining us today. We're doing something a little different, and um, I hope you bear with us with the technology. We're going to do a live panel as part of um, the key part of this uh, presentation, because our objective really is to provide practical information about peer support and its impact on the healthcare team through personal and professional stories. So I have four um, wonderful people joining me today and they will be the panelists who can speak from their lived experience about the um the value of peer support and what that what that is and how it creates a wonderful um opportunity for folks i um in terms of our time i'm going to take just a very little bit of time to really kind of set the stage around peer support there are uh more lengthy webinars on the on the PCTCC site around peer support. 
But um, just for those of you that may not have been able to attend those webinars, I want to just kind of set the stage. So peer support is, um, most of us know what peer support is if we think about either being a teenager or having teenagers because you know what peer pressure is and it can lead our kids or when we were kids um, to do things that we would not normally do. And sometimes we think of peer pressure as being a negative thing, um, but it also can be a very positive thing in terms of peer support. So it's the same impact, but in a positive active, activating way. Um, a peer is two or more people who have a lived experience of, with a similar health problem or challenge. And um, a peer supporter is the person who has the personal experience with the health condition, who's trained and in some way is, um, has um, supervision or is working in partnership with others to um, support someone else who is not as far along the road of working with that particular health condition. <clears throat> so its purpose is to share information, enhance emotional support, provide guidance on what works from that person's perspective, and that can often help someone else identify what works what might work for them as well, and to help them connect with community resources. And what you see on this slide is just some individuals who both are um, healthcare professionals talking about the value of peer support, but also people who are providing peer support. But we'll get a lot more um, uh, good information from our panelists, so I'm gonna move on. So Tanya, I hope that you're not, okay. So there are different kinds of formats for peer support and the scope and breadth can be different. Um, one of the things, um, you can have small groups, you can have one-on-one, -on -one, it can be in-person, it can be by phone, it can be virtual. Uh, you can, the advantage of peer support is it can be offered across the United States, but it's also spreading internationally. That is, as long as we have a connection in the virtual world, we can provide peer support. Um, there are a number of settings where peer support happens. There are or community-based organizations, um, and we've got a panelist, Jenna, who will be talking about a community-based organization, and that's a setting where um, they are supporting peer support. There are national organizations, and Jim is gonna talk about that a little bit, and then there are peer support uh, systems within healthcare organizations, and our other two panelists have experience in that. So the, the advantage of peer support is that it can be in a variety of settings. And one of the things that is really important in the TCPI Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative is that we really um, focus on and enhance person and family engagement. And in terms of peer support, there are a couple things that um, patients um, and families can do. Um, it increases patient and family activation because it builds connections with other people who have a lived experience, people who can demonstrate some confidence and skills and knowledge in managing their own chronic conditions. It can help people improve their health literacy because people who have had experience and have successfully navigated the healthcare system can share that experience with others. And it can also enhance shared decision making and medication management support, all important things as it relates to. to um, patient and family engagement. From the clinician's perspective and those people within the healthcare system, it can save time because peers can answer questions, non-medical questions, but provide support, emotional and information support so that patients seek less from their provider. Um, it can provide valuable information on living with the condition and providing practical tips that, that providers um, might not know because they haven't lived with that particular condition. It can increase um, individuals' um, shared decision-making related to their treatment plans, and what we know about shared decision-making is if somebody fully participates in that um, development of a treatment plan, they're much more likely to follow through with it. It can help improve patient outcomes and uh, increase patient and family access to community resources. So there's lots of really important reasons why um, peer support is an important adjunct and um, partnership with community members who have lived experiences and can partner with the healthcare team and really expand the support to people with lived uh, conditions. 
So there are lots of benefits to, uh, to the patient and family members who receive peer support. And some of those are listed, but I'm wanting for the panelists to talk about how that has impacted them in their lives. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail about that. But, um, but it also um, can be helpful to the mentors. So one of the things that clinicians and others in healthcare often are concerned about is, well, what is um, the, how can we ensure that there are quality and safety controls? And the primary way that that happens is through role clarity. A peer support supporter is not a professional. A professional medical person receives their knowledge from education and training, and they can support the patient via counseling, problem solving, and skill development training. That is, somebody who has, uh, has a condition such as diabetes, the, the medical professional can share um, the medical information about that. A peer supporter, someone who also has diabetes, is going to share knowledge from their personal experience and provide emotional support via that shared experience. So being able to be really clear about the roles of the medical professionals and the peer supporters is really important. Um, one of the important roles that clinicians play is um, being able to assist and creating a bridge to peer support resources for their patients and family members. And so there are some key things that clinicians can do to, to um, support patients in connecting with peers. One is to understand the function and value of peer support. Um, and we have a handout that you can download around that, as well as in these slides, there are um, articles that you may find useful to read about the evidence related to peer support. So for clinicians to really understand what the value is and what we know from the evidence. Um, being ready to have the conversation as part of a uh, holistic conversation that you have with patients and families when they're newly diagnosed with a condition. Um, sometimes that means having a, a, a script or having a particular way that you might introduce um, the idea of peer support to an um, it might be um, by saying some patients have found it helpful um, to, uh, to connect with others who live with this particular condition. Would that be something that's of interest to you? And then if the patient or family member says yes, that would be useful then being able to connect them to the community resources. So that requires that you know the appropriate resources. community resources. The other thing that I think is really important um, before we get into the panel is that clinicians need to, to realize that every patient, regardless of their educational level, um, can benefit by peer support. And oftentimes, um, clinicians may make an assumption that somebody who is highly educated, as an example, wouldn't really need peer support. And in fact, that's not um, true. It's uh, true that, that individuals who are faced with life-changing conditions can benefit by connecting with others who have had a lived experience related to that. Because although I might be highly educated, um, this is a new condition for me, and, um, and hearing from other people can be very useful in my navigating my new health condition. So it is really important that clinicians understand value, have conversations to facilitate those connections, and to um, allow and encourage everyone to consider this as an option for them. So I, we have today's panelists, and I want to get right into the panel because we've got these wonderful individuals who are going to be able to um, share with you what their experience of peer support is in the variety of ways that they've been doing that. And so what you see is the live Jana, Alice, and and Jim are live, um, and Naomi, um, we have a beautiful picture of Naomi Williams. Um, she's joined the call, but she was unable to connect with the video cam, and so we regret we can't see her live when she's answering questions and responding to the panel, but um, you'll learn a lot from Naomi as well. So rather than my introducing them in great detail, what I wanted to do is have the panelists introduce themselves and tell you how they became interested in peer support and uh, the different ways that they have uh, capacities that they participated in 
peer support, and then we'll drill down to those experiences in greater detail. And just for the purpose of, um, because Naomi can't see, um, and we can't see Naomi. Naomi, I'd, I'd love for you to, to start us off, and then we'll go to Janet and go across the screen. So Naomi? I'm hoping you're not on mute. I'm actually looking like she's disconnected at the moment. Uh, so maybe we oh, okay. everyone else first. Well, okay, Jana, would you be um, so kind as to go into your introduction and tell us about yourself? Of course. Thank you, Mary. Um, again, my name is Jana Merle. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at Raising Special Kids. and. I'm also the parent of a young adult son that has cerebral palsy, and that's how I first became involved with parent-to-parent -parent support um, because I myself was a, uh, a mom that received that parent-to-parent peer-to-peer support from another parent that had a shared lived experience, and it was a tremendous help for me as a young mother, um, whereas I had no experience of having a child with a disability and um, to be able to just talk with another mom and be able to feel like I wasn't going crazy and, um, and be able to have just some real open conversations about um, what those experiences might be like. And it helped me with kind of being able to look to the future for hope. Um, so that started me on that journey of of being involved in parent-to-parent -parent support, and I, I learned quickly that I wanted to be a parent mentor and help other moms um, that had Tucker, my son, also experienced an early birth and spent many months in the in the NICU. So I became a parent volunteer or a parent mentor, and it really brought purpose to what I had been through and what I've learned, and um, and then that kind of grew into working at Raising Special Kids um, as a staff member. Um, going from a volunteer to an actual to a staff member, um, but now working for an organization that values parent-to-parent -parent support, it is the heart of what we do here at Raising Special Kids. Um, this organization was founded 40 years ago on that on parent-to-parent -parent support from a group of parents that met and said, you know, we need each other, um, and so Raising Special Kids um, values the parent-to-parent -parent support that we can offer for families. Um, the parents that we connect are trained parent mentors, and um, I won't get into all the detail of that at this point in time, um, but anyway, that is a little synopsis of how I came to be involved in this, in this space. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to one of my other panelists. Alice, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you, Mary, and thank you so much for organizing this. Um, so I'm Alice Georgitso. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. I was born with congenital heart disease that was diagnosed when I was four weeks old. I've been really blessed that my mother sent me to a camp for children with congenital heart disease starting at age 10. So I really grew up with a large network of friends who had similar situations that I was going through and we really empowered one another to all of us um, do quite well and live almost normal lives, really. And uh, most recently, about a year ago, I had a heart transplant at Stanford um, Healthcare here in the Bay Area. And since then, I've become a volunteer with Stanford, and I joined their Patient and Family Advisory Council for the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Department. So we really focus on improving the care for patients, making things more efficient, and helping the department like that. Um, and then we created a peer-to-peer -peer support program for our adult congenital heart patients at Stanford. And now I am mentoring um, patients who are waiting for organ transplant and also have congenital heart disease. So it's been a wonderful process where I received somewhat peer-to-peer -peer support in an informal way growing up. And now I'm providing it in a more formal way, but I really enjoy it. Great. Thanks, Alice. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Vant Ellis. I'm a 13-plus uh, year advanced late stage uh, lung cancer survivor. I'm also the father of a, of a daughter who has cerebral palsy. 
my wife was in fact uh, six and a half months pregnant the day I was diagnosed. So we ended up spending much of the time that I was getting chemo and radiation, getting kicked out of the NICU to go and get my chemo and radiation. Uh, I started my experience as a um, as a peer mentor uh, at my children's hospital. Uh, somehow it's easier to uh, give back uh, when it's somebody else that you're talking about, uh, for me anyway. After about five years, I got sucked into being a pen peer mentor on the lung cancer side. Uh, and I've done that both at a, an institution level uh, at St. Joe's Mercy and at, and at uh, University of Michigan and through national institutions like Free to Breathe or Lung Cancer Research Foundation, um, organizations that, that commonly get contacted when somebody first gets their, first gets their diagnosis. Um, and kind of like Alice, I think all I have to do is breathe to inspire people. Um, so, but peer mentorship seems to, uh, I, I think one of the things that I would stress about what Mary said was that peer mentorship in my world of lung cancer seems to be as much about improving health literacy as anything else. Um, and, and expanding the experience of of the person that's going through what they're going through helping to give them a new language or help helping to help helping them to better understand the new language that they're being confronted with um i also do some patient advocacy work but that seems to be very much different than the or is very much different than the the the, the peer mentoring work. That's all Great. I got. Thanks, right. Jim. Well, you have a lot more after we get on to other questions. I know. Um, I uh, am knowing that Naomi is on the line, but may not have audio. But I'm going to just check in to see if we fix the audio. Naomi, can you join us? As soon as you can join us, because I know you can hear us, um, please feel free to just um, jump into the conversation and let us know that you are, um, you're available. So um, as we think about, you, you all have a, a variety of experiences. Jenna, I'm curious, as a organizer of peer support programs and the connecting of, of a, a peer mentor to someone new, um, can you talk a little bit about what that process is like and how you prepare your mentors and um, and give us an idea of that role clarity that I was talking about to create a positive experience? Yeah, um, so what we do is we provide a parent training for parents that are ready to begin their journey of being a parent mentor. And what that training looks like is because we want to assess their readiness to be able to provide support in such a way that it helps empower the other parent that's seeking the support to, um, to, to be able to express joy and hope for the future and help them feel, ultimately feel better about, about their life. Um, so whenever we work with a parent that wants to become a parent mentor, they do, like I said, go through a training process after we have a really open conversation about assessing readiness. And, um, and then they participate in the training. It includes um, objectives that focus on active listening skills, um, ethical guidelines, confidentiality, um, not sharing any information about their connection with their, their family and friends. Um, we find in Arizona, the disability community is quite small, and so we wanna protect that family's um, confidentiality and their family story. Um, and then we also talk about other things that involve ethical guidelines, like um, 
not to use the connection for personal gain, not to use it to sell something or talk about politics or religion, that it's all about providing emotional support for the, for the parent that's seeking the support. So they do go through that training process. Um, they, they also, we also include elements about how to tell your story in an effective way, how to share just enough information, portion and moderation, um, how to describe, not prescribe. In other words, you know, this is what's worked for our family and, and for, have you considered this and what do you think you want to try next? And it's all about empowering the other parent. Um, and then, the, so once the family has gone through the, the training process and they've become a trained parent mentor, here at Raising Special Kids, we also, um, we also do a background check. So they um, agree to a background check as well. And then when a family reaches out to Raising Special Kids for support, they may come to us for a variety of reasons. We served over 9,000 families last year um, for many, many different things information about special education, about how to navigate the healthcare system, and then also about seeking parent, parent support. Um, and so when a family is referred to raising special kids or they come to us organically, um, then we have a really nice open conversation as a family, as family support staff to triage what their immediate needs are. And that may be, again, assistance with problem solving, but at the end of the day, they may also be really wanting a parent-to-parent -parent connection. So then we go into our database. We do have a really robust database that helps us um, with lots of details about the families that, that are the trained parent mentors. And we go in and we search our database for that perfect match. And what that looks like is we try to match for issue, for diagnosis if we can, the gender of the child, um, um, that they live in, in a similar geographic area because then they are familiar with the resources in their area. Um, and then we match accordingly. Um, I could go into the process of what that looks like. We do follow um, a best practice model where those matches are, there are at least four matches in an eight, or four connections between the parent mentor and the parent mentee in an eight week period of time. And then we evaluate after um, after they've they've had their connection and we want to make sure it was a good connection we want to make sure that the family is still being supported if they need to be supported so we have that nice evaluation conversation after the whole match is completed um, and I'm happy to say that over 97 percent of the families that received connections last year reported that it helped improve their ability to advocate for their child or felt hope for the future and and that um, they felt like it was a reliable source of information. Hopefully that's Great. kind of what you were looking for, Mary. Yeah, that gives me an overview of how your organization does their training. Um, I think that Naomi is on the line now. Naomi? I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I'm so <laughs> glad you were able to connect. So we're just going to go back for a moment. And can you just introduce yourself to the group so that they understand what your background is and your role as a mentor? <laughs> Absolutely. I think my title today will be professional flexibility person. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> my name is Naomi Williams. I am I'm a family support coordinator here at the Children's Hospital of Georgia. Um, and I am a patient advisor on behalf of my son, Noah. Um, Noah is nine and a half, and he was born extremely premature, and we spent five months in the NICU, and he has a host of um, medical complexities, but he is more than that. Um, so I got introduced to parent mentoring um, because of my son. Um, and it was a lifeline for me. And not only have I been mentored, um, I am also a mentor um, and have just learned through this world that adaptability and flexibility is important. And that's something that I work to teach families as well. Great. Thank you, Naomi, for joining us. So um, one of the uh, thoughts about training and preparation is that we really believe strongly that lived experience um, carries a lot of weight. 
Um, at the national level, Jim, can you talk a little bit about um, what kinds of things you think helped prepared, prepared you to be a mentor? Um, I, I think from, uh, this is just my opinion, but I think one of the things that helps uh, me is that I think my job is to listen. I, I, I think that this, that this role requires listening and, and eliciting um, feelings from people that don't necessarily have a safe place to express those feelings. Uh, somebody that's newly diagnosed with a with a potentially terminal disease like like lung cancer doesn't want to go to their spouse and talk about the possibility of dying. Doesn't want to go um, and and talk to others about what do I do next because they don't expect other people to to understand that and and as often as not when they're asking, what do I do next? They're asking, can I talk about what I think my options are? Um, and getting them to talk about what they think their options are and maybe helping them with, with, with your own story. Again, it's, it's one of those things of offering some hope for a tomorrow and, and the reality that, yeah, we're all gonna die, but just not today, maybe. Um, and, and making plans for tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. From a national standpoint, I get, I get calls um, at all kinds of times, uh, but typically I'll get a call from the organization that wants to refer somebody to me that, that thinks they need to, needs, thinks that they need to talk to somebody that's been there. Uh, I'll take that call. I'll try to un to try to understand as much as I can about what our commonalities might be, um, and then you take the call and you just start asking people about their given position. Um, I know I've I've mentioned this to you, Mary, in the past, but um, people don't really know. They don't know what their options are. They don't know whether or not they're going to alienate somebody for for asking for a second opinion. They don't know if they're in the right place um, to get the treatment that they that they might need. And and just listening to them as they talk through some of that, listening to them as they talk through what they think they should be doing. Um, mm -hmm in a non-judgmental fashion is, is, can be helpful. Thank you. So Alice, I'm wondering what your experience was when you were first um, connected with a peer. Yes. And what made you over time think you wanted to do that for someone else? Yes, so to be completely honest, we started our peer-to-peer uh, program with uh, the adult congenital group and I was kind of more of a guinea pig as we needed mentors so and we wanted our program to start so I was willing to sign up and I think it's been a really good experience for myself and my mentee um, and when I first spoke with her and I heard that she was in um, she's about in her 30s and she has never met anybody even with congenital heart disease I thought this is so wonderful that I can share these experience I have. And anybody who goes through transplant will learn that it is a very complicated process. And there's no doubt that every physician and every medical staff member you meet is really rooting for you and doing their best to um, find the best options for you. But the bottom line is they don't have the time to give you the amount of information you need. And I did a lot of, when I was waiting for a transplant, I did a lot of my own research on where do organs come from? What service areas? What do the statuses mean when you're listed? How can you move up in statuses? You know, with the end goal being you want to have that transplant. So I've been 
really happy to see how much the information I took the time to learn has been able to benefit my mentee. And of course, every situation is different and no two stories are going to be the same, but I can provide her with the knowledge that I've learned and she can take it um, to her physicians and see what would help her. And then additionally, my mother, who is really the reason why I've done so well, I can't take full credit at all. She was able to connect with my mentee's mother, who her mother has as well never met anybody with congenital heart disease or has no relationship with people waiting for a transplant. And our mother has also shared a lot. And I think being a caregiver, you have a completely different view. So it's wonderful that they're able to connect through us now. And that's what we really do with our patient and family advisory council at Stanford is we look at the patient support as well as the caregiver support. And it seems like um, other people here are doing the same thing where we're providing that support for the caregivers that are equally as important for the patient to succeed. Great. Thanks, Alice. Naomi, you mentioned as well that you were involved in a patient and family advisory council and it had a link to the mentorship program. Can you talk a little bit about that and how what the relationship is between the council and the mentorship program and how they support um, each other? Right. So we are actually just getting our program up from the advisory council to the mentorship. Um, but what that is looking like is being able to have individuals who have walked the walk and talked the talk who can actually um, assist others who are in who are in that life now, who are going through um, the hospitalization, the fears, the struggles, the unknown. Um, so we're looking at this, we're doing this for our NICU, our neonatal intensive care unit and for our pediatric unit. Um, and it, it just, it adds a level of, um, it increases trust, um, and adds another level of support because we do a great job in taking care of the patients um, and figuring out wanting to know how we can better take care of the families that will be taking care of the loved ones. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just something about, I know in connecting with other NICU moms, when I say, you know, I understand what it means to have to get permission to come back and see your child. I understand what it means to stand at a sink and wash your hands for three minutes before you can go back um, to talk to your child. And that guard, the guards become, um, the walls start to come down. Um, and then mm -hmm. there's a, another level of familiarity. Um, and again, going back to building that trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is so important. I, I wonder, what do you think, and this is just, oh, you know, whoever wants to respond to this question, but what do you think might prevent someone from becoming involved um, with a peer mentor or in uh, being referred for getting a, getting a match? What might prevent somebody from doing that? So I would think initially maybe it would be the whole stigma of, you know, you are suffering emotionally right now. And I think that our country as a whole has moved in a more positive direction for helping people suffering with any type of mental illness. So I hope in time that that goes away as, some, as a barrier. But for us, with starting our peer-to-peer -peer support program, a biggest thing is really trying to get the physicians on board. And as much as every time they walk into that appointment, we know they have so much on their mind and so much to discuss, but to keep this in the back of their mind and um, introduce the idea to patients that they think maybe it need um, because I think a lot of people they don't know the resources that are out there. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Jim? Um, I come from a, a, a I, I appreciate the word stigma being used because I think that, that I come from a world where stigma is really an issue uh, lung cancer is one of those stigmatized diseases. The first thing people ask or imply when you say that you had lung cancer is they, they kind of look at you and go, smoker? And, and it, it's as if people treat it as if it's self-inflicted. Um, 
for a lot of the people that I mentor or, or support, um, their reluctance to ask for help, to ask for mentorship is tied to either that stigma or within the veteran population, which I'm also, I also support the veterans population. There's a, there's a macho thing that goes on. If you go to, if you go to lung cancer, uh, support organizations or, or, uh, summits, about 80% of the people that attend are women. Men tend not to mm. participate. Um, so that, that's a part of it. The other part of it is, is sometimes it, it depends on where they're being treated and the support that they get from their treatment team with regards to the value of peer relationships. Um, if that's not enhanced by their their care physician or, or their care team, it's it can be hard to overcome. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Naomi or Jana? My thought, um, it, it, coming from more from on the provider side. Um, where there are stereotypes in the sense of who needs the support um, and thinking certain classes or so certain socioeconomic um, classes, certain um, cultural and ethnic groups, um, whereas it can be any and everyone um, as opposed to just who we think should go. And the other part is in people knowing about it or not knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? I just want to say, I think geographically it's a huge difference. So I'm originally from New York and I moved to California about five years ago. And in California, it's much more accepted, you know, to talk of your feelings and and that's fine, but in New York, I noticed people were a lot shyer about it. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's a huge stigma right there probably, but from what I saw, it's somewhat true from what I experienced. And I mean, all of us are kind of from different areas. So I think that it's great that we're talking about it. So I'm sure it's different based on the region we're living in too. Mm -hmm. Good point, Alice. I, I would I would agree with that, Alice, 100%. Um, we do see that Arizona is a real uh, transient state. We have folks from all over the country that come here, and so we do see that that um, there are definitely some cultural um, differences as it relates to whether or not you want to seek support. Um, but another barrier that we have seen is that many of our young families. Um, experience or seek out support in in the virtual setting and are a little more comfortable mm. with that than that that um more um where it, you're actually getting to experience the connection with a, a person's voice over the phone um so that that is a space that we're also kind of looking into because we want to make sure that if because parents are, are seeking support from each other you know through social media outlets um, however, that's a little less, um, a, a little less safe, I guess, for lack of a better term, because the parent, the, the parents haven't participated in a training likely, and then there's no evaluation that can be done afterwards to make sure that it was helpful for them. However, you know, we do want to be responsive to that need. Um, the, the reality is, though, like, like, like we, I think we all know is that when you hear a parent's voice or a, a peer's voice, the inflection where they say, I really do get it. I really do understand. I think we can all agree that when you can hear that inflection rather than see it typed, um, there's there's a little more value in that, a little more of a heart connection to where you feel emotion, more emotionally supported. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. I'm noticing the time. This has been such a rich conversation, and I want to give participants who are on the call the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and I, um, 
Tanya, I think you were going to be monitoring the chat to see if there were any questions that came up in the chat, and I believe people can raise their hands if they have some questions. Um, so I want to just pause for a minute so that if I have additional questions, I can ask the panel, um, but I want to also give people on the, the phone an opportunity to ask any questions that have been generated through the conversations that we've been having. Thank you, Mary. Yes, we have one question, and the question is, if you are setting up a PM mentoring program, would you recommend providing stipends or other incentives to the mentors? What is the best way to recognize and show, and show appreciation to the mentors? Jana, do you want to, as an organization that supports that, do you want to start? And you guys might have some, Naomi and Alice and Jim, you may have some comments as well. Well, um, I would like to say that it is really important to express gratitude and appreciation to parent mentors. Um, what we have found, though, is that that the parents that want to want to volunteer, they want to do it. They, um, we don't need to pay a stipend to them to have for them to want to give back. They're at that point in their life where they want to provide another parent or another family hope for the future through their shared lived experience. So um, it's something that has just happened at raising special kids really beautifully and organically because families really see and know the value of it. Um, but we are very cognizant of the fact of wanting to show appreciation to their time because the majority of families are, are extremely busy with kids with complex medical needs and things like that. And so we want to acknowledge the value of their of their wisdom, of their experience, and of and of their really, really valuable priceless time. Yes. I think, I think, Jenna, you put it really well. Um, those who are truly passionate about it and are going to be able to offer the most meaningful relationship with mentees, I don't think they need to be paid. And I'm afraid if you started offering stipends, you might be attracting um, someone that wouldn't be able to give the relationship you're hoping for. Um, one thing with the peer to peer programs at Stanford, they try not to match mentors with more than one to two mentees, and that is to respect their time. And it's really stressed if you do feel overwhelmed or you feel like maybe you have too many mentees um, to let them know because they do, like Jenna said, want to respect your time and they care about, you know, your well-being and your health too. Jim or Naomi, any additional comments? Um, all I would add, I, I have a problem with compensating patients for for this kind of work, mostly because it's part of our healing, too. Um, telling our story and relating our stories um, and, and sharing our experiences with with peers is part of our healing process and our, our ability to deal with what we've been through, it, it would seem to me to cheapen it, to compensate for it. Tanya, were there any other questions? I have one kind of closing question for each of the panel members before I share some resource slides, but if there's another question from the participants, we want to get to it. Anything else, Tanya? No, we don't have any other question at this moment. Okay. So um, what I'm hoping, and we'll start with you, Naomi, is um, sometimes when there's a moderator for a panel, they don't ask the right question, and you, you have something you want to share about your experience related to peer support that you haven't been able to share because I didn't ask the right question. So I'm going to give each of you an opportunity to share any advice or insights um, that that you want to with those that are listening on the webinar that you haven't been able to share yet that you think is really an important component of peer support or something that you want them to understand. So Naomi? Um, oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, 
I would just say the the benefit I think is undervalued um, from for peer support, and you never know who will need it. So just being able to offer it and helping to take away, as mentioned before, the stigma and the stereotypes, um, and and being able to have those that are in a space where there's no judgment. And that that is a Mm -hmm. huge, huge, what I'm finding for me and where people are finding relief. I live in the South, which is a big Bible belt. um, Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of judgment that goes around regarding religion. Um, So having supporters who are non-judgmental and have various avenues of where they can help support. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Jim? I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is that one of the earliest experiences I had as a member of a a PFAC uh, or a a, a PFCC at, at University of Michigan was that I got asked to sit on a pediatric ethics committee. I ended up sitting on that for for 12 years. Um, And one of the things that was most heartening was the invitation by the Ethics Committee to include patients on the on-call status. When, when 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 an ethics consult was requested by either a caregiver or a patient or whatever, um, at my children's hospital, it included patient, a, a, a patient, a, a PFCC member. And I can't tell you how many of those consults I went into as a parent where there was conflict, where there was miscommunications, where it turned into a peer mentoring c- scenario because they could talk to me or uh, they felt, people felt that they could talk to me because of my experience. It also was important to me that it was part of, the, of a PFCC program because it meant that I had other people that I could go back to in difficult situations and ask for advice and guidance um, because I didn't know how to do all of this 12, 13 years ago. Um, and because I knew that if any other parent was or, or any other patient was being asked to go into a consult like that, that they had also been vetted and trained. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, right. So I was never embarrassed by my organization. I was so I, I continue to be incredibly proud of Uni- University of Michigan and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So great. Thanks, Jim. Alice. Last um, thought. Yeah, for me, I think that the biggest thing from peer support that sometimes um, is underestimated is our ability to empower others. So for what I focus on with congenital heart disease, it's a lifelong disease that starts from birth. And your life, your entire life is affected by your disease if you allow it to be. So um, like Naomi said about her son that I loved was that he's so much more than any health issue he may have. And I loved being able to have support and give support because we're able to show each other, you know, what we're capable of still doing and provide that empowerment. And I think peer support's also wonderful because you're not building a dependency, you are giving people strength. So yes, the moment they seek out a mentorship program, they may be in their lowest moment. And hopefully that support you provide them will build them back up to their fullest potential. Great, thanks. And Jana, we have just a moment, so last thoughts? I couldn't agree more. Um, I love what everyone shared. The last quick thought is for those that, clinicians that might be listening, that um, the value of the emotional support that that families are seeking is something that, that we have time to do that the 
that as clinicians that you don't have the time to do that, the luxury of the time to do that. And so just remembering that there's this, this that's, that's the priceless option, a choice that you can give to a family um, after they've been, um, they've learned something like this as part of their life. And uh, so that, that's my last thought. Great. I am just so um, um, thankful that you guys joined us on this call because the richness of your experiences and your insights and your advice is something that, that um, really enriches people's understanding of what peer support can be. I want people to be aware of some resources that are out there so you can learn more because one of the, the question that was asked was really, you know, how do you set up a program and Peers for Progress and Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care have materials um, and selected resources that can be useful to you. Um, there are a number of national organizations oops, um, that you, and you'll be able to download these slides, but there are a number of national organizations you can reach out to if you want to find out if they have the capability of being a resource to you and your community. Um, uh, parent to Parent is, is nationwide, but um, has state chapters, um, which is Jana's organization in Arizona. We, um, for those of you that want to read more about it in terms of the evidence, because I you know, mentioned a number of benefits in terms of health outcomes and those kinds of things, we've got some selected articles that you can follow up on. There also is a flyer. Um, we do have a free online learning community dedicated to partnerships with patients and families, and we raise questions and issues around peer support, and you're welcome to join that community. Um, there's no cost, and it is an opportunity. Um, so I want to thank the panel again, and I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn and, and Tanya to kind of wrap things up. But again, Jim, Alice, Naomi and Jana, thank you so very much for your participation today. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Mary and the panelists. Um, and it looks like we're at time. So thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. Please take the post webinar survey and your, um, your feedback will be greatly appreciated. And we will send you the recording um, to you within 24 hours. And please feel free to contact us at our, in, from our contact information on the slides. Again, thank you very much, and I hope everyone have a good day. Thank you. Great. Take care, Take care everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.